Bible poems, Daniel. Forerunner of the exile and expositor of God's purposes in history. Herald of God's kingdom and a faithful witness in a pagan land. Four captives head-hunted for Nebuchadnezzar's civil service, make their plans to guard their loyalty to their God. A simple diet would be fine, finding favour with the king's official Ashpenaz. They put up with their pagan names, Belteshazzar, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. After three years, they lead their cohort. The Lord of Kings has messages for the men on top. For these, Daniel has been given a gift of insight into dreams. Nebuchadnezzar is pleased to think he is a golden head. Soon, proudly, he will make his image all of gold. But what of the rock, not cut by human hands, which will shatter his and all the following kingdoms? God wills a kingdom nothing can destroy. As for the golden statue, step forward Daniel's three friends, who refuse to bow, believing God will save, but willing to offer up their lives if not. Soon they are walking in the fiery furnace in their finest clothes. Another is seen there with them, a godlike fourth. Accomplices are the ones in cinders. Nebuchadnezzar, impressed but unchanged, needs a more personal message. Once more he dreams, this time a glorious tree hewn down. The king, unless he heeds the warning, would lose his human dignity and live among the beasts. It happens. His pride is judged. At last, a real prayer, and at least for a while, some knowledge of the King of Heaven and his righteous ways. Fast forward to the end of Babylon's power. Belshazzar, the prince regent, throws a feast, orders goblets ransacked from Jerusalem's, Jerusalem's temple all those years ago, from which to drink the wine. In addition, his guests make this a pretext to brag about their homemade gods. In drunken stupor, Belshazzar sees the writing on the wall. A hand, and rightly panics. The Queen Mother sends for aged Daniel. Soon things are worse. Proud Belshazzar will be humbled. His reign is nearly over. The Persians at the gates. By morning, he is dead. Daniel back in favour in Darius' imperial service, rising fast again. His rivals hatch a plan to catch him through his uncompromising godliness. Bravely, Daniel says his usual prayers, faces Jerusalem, then lions. Delivered by the Sovereign Lord, not so fortunate his persecutors and their families. Now we are invited to go back in time a little to hear about revelations given to Daniel in dreams and visions of worldly rulers, beastly and more beastly, but subject to the Lord of heaven and earth. Then of the Lord's own rule, 
a vision of the very throne of God. This time no beast but one like a human being comes with the clouds of heaven fit to enter God's very presence. To him was given authority and sovereign power and the worship of all nations. God's holy people will share his kingdom. Remember Daniel's personal exile has been longer than the nation's. But now he shows them what an exile's prayer should be. We sinned. We're deaf to your prophets. You rightly scattered us. We, kings and people, failed to heed the warnings of your word. Now turn your anger away from Jerusalem. Restore your sanctuary. Forgive, O Lord. Two reassuring words for all who pray. As soon as you began to pray, out went a word. Then a message of God's esteem, ours too in Christ. More words about the future. Jerusalem must suffer more. Caught in crossfire, or hunted out, the temple be profaned. Powers will be ranged against the people of the Lord, but their names are written in his book. Daniel sees a glorious vision, one clad in priestly linen, sparkling with brilliance, all aglow with golden fire. Fainting, He feels that hand and hears that voice, that word again, esteemed. Peace now, be strong. Finally, the greatest promise to a lifelong exile. One day you'll be home.